For those of you who missed part 1, 2, 3, and 4, I suggest you watch them before watching this part. But, I'll give you a quick rundown. So in part 1, I went over what I call the world's greatest family tree, and basically I showed how all of the presidents, including Donald Trump, and many people who have ran for the US presidency, are related to the Queen of England, or basically the royalty in England. And I also went into how all the other royal families in Europe, like the royal family in Spain, France, etc., are also related to the royal family in England. And on a side note, relating to the world's greatest family tree, I came across this information about Queen Elizabeth's ancestry. On this website, Genie, which I'm sure stands for genealogy, you find some interesting information that most people aren't aware of. The most interesting... There's some things here that are highlighted, which I kind of already go over in part one, which is that Queen Elizabeth is related to all European royal families, uh, reigning and not reigning. But you also find something else very interesting here that I'm sure, as I said already, not many people are aware of. And that is the many ethnicities that Queen Elizabeth is made of. So it says here at the bottom... Elizabeth bears lineage from amongst others, that means that there are more other than the ones included here, Armenian, Arab, British, Chinese, Cuman, Danish, French, German, Greek, Hungarian, Italian, Monegasque, Norwegian, Old Prussian, Polish, Portuguese, Romanian, Russian, Serbian, Spanish, Swedish, Ukrainian, and Yugoslavian ethnicities. You have to ask yourself, why is she made up of so many different ethnicities? Well, I believe the answer to that is that these elite went around and they intermarried with the elites of all the other countries around the world. They joined all of the ruling families in the different countries together into one family. And that is precisely why all of the royal European families are related. However, after looking at this, after looking at her containing Chinese Russian, and these other ethnicities, I would go so far as to say that yes, they also intermarried into the Chinese elite, as well as the Russian, and as well as everywhere else in the world. And then in part two, I began investigating the origins of this bloodline. And I started my investigation into this bloodline in ancient Egypt for three reasons. One, because ancient Egypt is considered one of the first civilizations right after, if not right alongside, ancient Mesopotamia. Two, because the rulers today seem to have some kind of special obsession with ancient Egyptian symbolism and ancient Egyptian architecture, specifically an obsession with ancient Egyptian obelisk, like the obelisk that can be found in the city of London, Washington DC, and the Vatican. And three, because of something that is said in this documentary, actually the premise of this documentary, and that is this. The world's biggest and best kept secret is that the descendants of the Hebrew pharaohs of Egypt have ruled throughout history. And for those of you who want to know, the name of that documentary, if you didn't see the screenshot, is titled Ring of Power. Uh, if you type into Google Ring of Power documentary, you'll get it. It's just under five hours long. It's probably one of the best documentaries I've watched. I'd say there's just like a couple of bits of information that are just a little bit off. But for the most part, it's a solid-ass documentary. Definitely highly recommended. And while exploring ancient Egypt to find the origin of this bloodline, I discovered that there was a cult in charge. And in part 3, I explore this cult, and I show that this cult was a moon cult, and that it is responsible for the Abrahamic religions of today. And this is kind of what the movie or the documentary Zeitgeist talks about. It talks about how all these religions can be traced back to ancient religions. But they're not ancient religions, it's an ancient cult. And it's specifically an ancient moon cult. And I showed the connection between this moon cult and Jesus Christ and other Abrahamic religions. And a little side note on this documentary Zeitgeist. This documentary, I, I don't trust it. It provides information, but it has a hidden agenda. And the hidden agenda in the documentary Zeitgeist is that Zeitgeist tries to make it as if all of these religions around the world have things in common because they're observing the same natural phenomena. Zeitgeist tries to say that, oh, it all comes from observations of the stars and of the planets. Zeitgeist is wrong there. These religions are the same. These cults are the same because it was the same group of people or the same elite spreading it around the globe. 
Also in part 3 and in part 4, I show how this moon cult ruled throughout ancient Egypt, or at least in part 3 I cover the Old Kingdom, and in part 4 I cover the Middle Kingdom. And one of the most important things that I covered in part 4 was the account of Herodotus. And Herodotus was a Greek historian. He's pretty much called the father of history. And he spent his entire life working on one project, which was the account of the origins and execution of the Greco Persian Wars. And essentially, Herodotus, a long story short, heard a story from Egyptian priests. And these priests claimed that there was a pharaoh by the name of Sestris who had conquered the entire world. And Herodotus also relates that when Sestris defeated an army without much resistance, he erected a pillar in their capital with a vagina on it to symbolize the fact that the army fought like women. And essentially in part 4, I show how these pillars are essentially the obelisk that exists in a lot of the capitals of the world, including the obelisk in the city of London, the Washington Monument, and the obelisk in the Vatican. And I'll admit, part 4, out of all the parts that I've made so far, was absolutely the worst one I've made. It was just terribly put together. I don't know what I was on when I was making that part, but it was just bad. So if you're going to watch any of them, watch 1, 2, and 3. And don't worry about part 4, because I'm basically going to pick up on some of the things mentioned in part 4, including the account of Herodotus. So I'm going to give you a quick rundown as to what I'm going to be going over in this part. I'm of course going to be looking more into the moon cult. I'm going to be providing evidence that this moon cult continued to rule in the new kingdom of Egypt, which is the third kingdom of Egypt. So I'm going to provide evidence for this moon cult in the third kingdom. I'm also going to show how this moon cult influenced Greek mythology or Greek cults, just like it influenced Abrahamic cults or Abrahamic religions. And that will actually bring us back to the account of Herodotus, which will show us that the extent of the Egyptian empire is much greater than what they teach us in school. And then hopefully by the end of this video, I will have finished ancient Egypt. And then in the next part, I'm going to be looking at the history before ancient Egypt to show where these ancient pharaohs actually came from. Exactly um, who they were before they were pharaohs. Alright, enough summarizing, let's jump right into this. There's a lot of information I have to cover, so I'll try to be quick with it, and I'll try not to be so fucking boring, alright? So, in the New Kingdom of Egypt, this is the Wikipedia page, it just summarizes the, the dates and the dynasties that fall under the New Kingdom. So, let's move on from here. We're going to go into the 18th Dynasty, which is the first dynasty of the, the New Kingdom. Okay, so, the 18th Dynasty contains some of Egypt's most famous pharaohs, including Atmos I, Hatshepsut, Thutmose III, Aminotep III, Akhenaten, and Tutankhamun. Queen Hatshepsut concentrated on expanding Egypt's external trade by sending a commercial expedition to the land of Punt. Okay, now we're going to take a pause here. We're going to look at where the hell is the land of Punt? See, when, when I saw this, I thought to myself, um, land of Punt? I don't think I'm too familiar with that, so let me Wikipedia the land of Punt. So the land of Punt was an ancient kingdom. A trading partner of Egypt, it was known for producing and exporting gold, aromatic resins, blackwood, ebony, ivory, and wild animals. The region is known from ancient Egyptian records of trade expeditions to it. It is possible that it corresponds to Apon on the Horn of Africa, as later known by the ancient Greeks. While some biblical scholars have identified it with the biblical land of Punt, or Havila, and I don't think I show it here, I don't think I have the file or the information set up or queued up here, so I'm just going to have to tell you guys that this place that the biblical scholars are trying to identify it with is located in Libya, much closer to Egypt than Opine on the Horn of Africa. Let's see where Opone on the Horn of Africa is. So Opone is on the Horn of Africa, it's over here. Now, we're going to take a look at this again later, when we talk about the full extent of the New Kingdom. But I just want to show real quick, the New Kingdom's Wikipedia page has this. It shows this is the maximum territorial extent in the 15th century BC of the New Kingdom. And here, if you look, it shows Punt as being over here. So they're saying Punt is just below Empire Kush, instead of being over here on the Horn of Africa. Which now takes us back to the account of Herodotus. Now, there is an entire book on the accounts of Herodotus where he covers a lot more information than what I'm about to cover, 
But this information comes from the Wikipedia page of Sesostris. And here is his account. It says, In Herodotus' histories, there appears a story told by an Egyptian priest about a pharaoh, Sesostris, who once led an army northward overland to Asia Minor, then fought his way westward until he crossed into Europe where he defeated the Scythians and Thracians possibly in modern Romania and Bulgaria. Sesostris then returned home, leaving colonists behind at the river Phasis and Colchis. Herodotus cautioned the readers that much of his story came secondhand via Egyptian priest, but also noted that the Colchians were commonly known to be Egyptian colonists in his histories. He says, for it is plain to see that the Colchians are Egyptians, and what I say, I myself noted before I heard it from others. And here's a Google map indicating exactly where that river is and exactly where the Colchis occupied. They basically occupied western Georgia, and not the state, the country. And the account of Herodotus goes on and is actually confirmed by two other historians living in two other time periods. So the account of Herodotus goes on to say, according to Diodorus, who, if you put your marker over that link, it says he's a Greek historian. Uh, he is known for writing the monumental universal history, Bibliotheca Historica. So according to that guy, Diodorus, who calls Sesostris uh, Sesusis, and Strabo, and Strabo is a Greek geographer slash philosopher and historian who lived in Asia Minor during the transitional period of the Roman Republic into the Roman Empire, so according to both of these historians, Sesostris conquered the whole of the world. Even Cynthia and Ethiopia divided Egypt into administrative districts or gnomes, was a great lawgiver, and introduced a caste system into Egypt and the worship of Serapis. Who is Serapis? Serapis is a Greco-Egyptian deity. The cult of Serapis was introduced during the 3rd century BC on the orders of Pharaoh Ptolemy I of the Tamala Kingdom as a means to unify the Greeks and Egyptians in his realm. So according to these guys, he conquered the whole of the world, or at least what was perceived as the world at the time, even Cynthia and Ethiopia. So let's look at Ethiopia on a map. Oh, look at that. Ethiopia is here. Now that's interesting because Ethiopia... And actually, this is the, I believe this is the modern map of Ethiopia. The ancient kingdom of Ethiopia, I believe, went to the water here. That's where these uh, other people are claiming Punt was at, but it's, Punt is not there. Punt was on the Horn of Africa in Opine, as I showed before. Here's the Scythia Empire. So he conquered there and there. So based off of this, let's look at a, a whole map of all of these areas that we just covered. So here are the places we just covered, marked with the red X. The green X is where the land of Punt or Opine is. That's where they establish a trading post or trading partners there. Or at least that's where some historians claim it is. Because remember, the location of the land of Punt is still up to debate. Some people are saying it's in Libya. I don't think it's in Libya, although I do believe Egypt occupied Libya too, but I'm not going to put that on the map right now. And then some other people are claiming that it's uh, like north of where Ethiopia is here. But no, I agree with the historians that claim that it is on the Horn of Africa over here in Somalia. And I agree with them because of all of these other facts. If there are historians and very reputable historians claiming that Egypt conquered these areas, it's not out of the question to say that, yes, uh, Egypt also traded as far south as Somalia. Oh crap, you know, I just realized I got ahead of myself a little bit. As you see, I have Greece marked with an X here too. And you'll see why in a second. You'll see that ancient Egypt actually did control ancient Greece. There's actually a very funny connection there. But I'm going to get to that in a little bit. So I filled all of this in with a spray can. And I know it's very crude. It's very poorly filled in. But uh, pretty much we can say that this was the actual territorial extent of Egypt, if we go based off of what these very reputable historians said. So as we can see, this is much greater than what they tell us in, in the history books. And actually, as you even see, even in the, the mainstream, in this mainstream map of the New Kingdom, the maximum territorial extent in the 15th century BC, you can see even this goes into Libya. So over here, I didn't even fill into Libya. I could have also filled into Libya here. So all that's important is this is a much greater extent than what mainstream history is teaching us. 
Anyway, I have to speed things up. I'm going to go back to the account of Herodotus, wrap that up real quick so we can move on to the pharaohs. So uh, Herodotus also relates that when Sesostris defeated an army without much resistance, he erected a pillar in their capital with a vulva on it to symbolize the fact that the army fought like women. These pillars are, of course, the obelisk that can be found in the United States, the Vatican, and the city of London. They can also be found in many, many other parts of the world. And I'm just going to make a quick note here that the documentary that I mentioned earlier, the Ring of Power documentary, this is something that that documentary actually gets wrong. Here is what that documentary says about these obelisks. What exactly is an obelisk? Obelisks are phallic-shaped monuments honoring the pagan sun god of ancient Egypt called Amun-Ra. The spirit of this pagan god is said to reside within the obelisk. Obelisks symbolize the phallus and fertility. At the base of the obelisk is a sunwheel circle symbolizing the vagina. Together, they depict male and female sexual union. So you see that documentary got it sort of wrong and sort of right. It's nice that the documentary realizes that those sun discs are a representation of the female vagina, but it pretty much gets everything else wrong. It does not symbolize male and female sexual union. It's actually like an insult to these people. It's putting it right in front of their faces too. Like, hey, you guys fought like women. We fucked you. All right, I'm going to just quickly mention two more things about the account of Herodotus, and that is, I will say that this other historian, Pliny the Elder, makes mention of Sesostris, who he claims was defeated by... Solasus, a gold-rich king of Colchis. Uh, I think that this guy's wrong, and I think he's wrong for a couple of reasons. Well, one, Colchis was an Egyptian colony, and the guy's name, who, who he claims defeated him, the name sounds so similar to Sesostris, and since Sesostris actually had different names, I would say that, no, what really happened was this guy who this uh, historian claims defeated Sesostris probably was Sesostris. And we're going to see that later on, is that the Egyptian rulers, or the, the members of this club, they are great at, at basically faking an identity. We're going to see later on, there is, uh, after the New Kingdom, there is a, a person who ruled the uh, northern part of Egypt, and then he also ruled the southern part of Egypt under a different alias. So it's like you had the same guy ruling both parts of Egypt, but under two different aliases. And, and this is this is just pure comedy. So this is exactly what I think is happening here. And I also think that it's happening here. I also think that this guy's wrong because of the fact that these pillars exist all around the world today. I say, no, this is was most definitely the same group. Not the same person, of course. This guy's not immortal, but definitely the same group who uh, who is doing this. And it's also what also needs to be said here, which is also very interesting. And that is that uh, over here, modern research, a pharaoh called Sesostris occupied the same position as the known pharaoh Senestret III of the 12th dynasty, right? So that's the 12th dynasty. That was the Middle Kingdom. But also over here to the right, it says uh, the great Sesostris identified in the 19th century engraving as Ramses II during the Battle of Kadesh. Now, this battle occurred in the New Kingdom. Uh, I think in the 19th dynasty or the 20th dynasty. Right now we're in the 18th dynasty. So this just goes to show that this name, Sesostris, I think it's actually just a title of like supreme ruler since these different guys used it. It was first associated, I believe, with this guy, Senestret. And also another point that needs to be made is that they said that uh, Sesostris divided Egypt into administrative districts. Well, that happened in the old kingdom. That happened in the original kingdom. After the pharaohs lost power, and this is a point that I believe I make in part three. Yeah, I make it in part three also. And the point that I make is that, yeah, the pharaohs had to divide their power. And this is exactly what they did today. What it is that the people caught on to the fact that the pharaohs weren't the gods that they pretended. So they had to kind of drop the pharaoh into the back and then split things up into administrative districts and have like different people ruling each district, and that will make it harder for the people to actually identify the problem, identify the ruler, and change things. And that's basically what they did during the American Revolutionary War. I believe that during that time period, the monarchs, the kings and stuff, they were aware of the fact that, hey, if you're a king, it actually sucks, because now all blame can be placed on you, and then people actually have a, they can actually point their finger at somebody. 
Well, when you have a democracy and you have this group of representatives that get changed out every, you know, X amount of years, it makes it impossible for the people to actually identify the problem and get real change done. Instead, you just have this constant cycling of basically the same people who work for the same club. Well, not the same exact people, but basically the people or a group of people who work for the same club. But anyway, I digress. Let's move on to the pharaohs. So I'm going to now move on to the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, to its founding figure, which is Amos the first. So Amos the first, sometimes written Amosis, was a pharaoh of ancient Egypt and the founder of the 18th dynasty. He was a member of the Theban royal house. What we're going to look at now real quick is we're going to look at his name and we're also going to look at where uh, the Theban royal house comes from. Two very interesting things. So um, Atmos, meaning born of Aya or A. Who, who is this? Aya. Okay, so is a lunar deity. This is what her Wikipedia says. Aya is a lunar deity. And by the way, it's also funny that her uh, translated as Ya, Ja, Ja. Kind of sounds very similar to Yahweh. But anyway, I'm not going to get into that. So Ea, Ea is a lunar deity in ancient Egyptian religion. So his name simply means moon. That's all that we need to find important right now is that the founder of the 18th dynasty already has this moon cult connection by claiming that he's born of the moon. And quickly coming back to something that I believe I mentioned in part three, which is this type of headdress or this headwear that you can see on the statue of Aya here. In part three, I had claimed that this headwear is actually a moon symbol. It stands for the crescent moon or the full moon sitting inside of a crescent moon. And I believe I mentioned how this symbolism, this crescent moon with a full moon, would later become the halo that we know today. And we're going to see this symbol on another moon deity real soon, so we're not going to go into that right now. Uh, let's move on to the claim that Amos was a member of the Theban royal house. Who is this Theban royal house? So here there's actually a link. There's a link on Theban, not Theban royal house. So we actually have to look at both of those things separately. Let's start off at Thebus, right? So there's a whole bunch of stuff said about Thebus. The most important thing that I found about Thebus is this. It was a cult center and the most venerated city of ancient Egypt during its heyday. So it's a cult center. Hmm, very interesting. What cult was there? So the cult there, when you click on that, by the way, it says right there, it, you can't really see because I have it highlighted but cult center is actually a link to something. I click on that link, I get this. I get a Theban triad. Oh, yes, the trio, the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost, or whatever the fuck. This is a different triad, though. We're going to see this. So, Theban triad. The Theban triad is a triad of Egyptian gods that were most popular in the area of Thebes, Egypt. The group consisted of Amun, his consort Mut, and their son Khonsu. So, let's go Amun, right? Who is Amun, right? This is very interesting. Amun. So I believe I went over Amun in another part, but I'm going to go into Amun in a lot of detail right now. So let's just skip right to the important information. So after the rebellion of Thebes against the Hyksos and with the rule of Amun I, which is the one we're talking about, Amun acquired national importance expressed in his fusion with the sun god Ra as Amun-Ra or Amun-Re. Now there's an interesting thing here, and that is that Amun... If you see here, most deities, they'll say right at the start that this deity or this god was associated with this thing. You know, it's a moon deity, it's a sun deity, it's a wind one. Amun, you can't find anything about him in his Wikipedia page. It's very difficult to find out what he is. And actually, when you Google search Amun, they always give you Amun-Ra. They always give you, oh, he's a sun god. And it's like, no, Amun is not a sun god. He was associated with the, the sun god after he fused with the sun god Ra. So in order to find out who Amun really was, what he was associated with, we have to go back up to this first paragraph, which says, Amun was attested from the old kingdom together with his wife, Amunet. So we have to actually, I click on Amunet, and Amunet brings us to her Wikipedia page. And the important thing, all we have to do is go down to her description and history. Here's what it says. Her name... Net, I don't, I don't know how that would be pronounced. I think that's correct. Net is a feminine noun that means the hidden one. She is a member of the Ogdoid of Hermopolis. We're going to look into that in a second. Who represented aspects of the primeval existence before the creation. 
Amunet was paired with Amun, whose name means the hidden one too, with a masculine ending. So there we go. So Amun, actually, all his name means is the hidden one. We don't know what he's associated with. He's just the hidden one. Sounds like the unseen hand, the, the hidden hand that rules over the world today. Before we go over the Ogdoid of Hermopolis, we're going to look at one more thing. Below here it says, The pyramid texts mention the beneficent shadow of Amun and Amunet. O oh, Amun and Amunet, you pair of the gods who join the gods with their shadow. So there is a relationship between Amun, the unseen, and shadows. So now let's look at the Ogdoid of Hermopolis, because they're very interesting. So you click on that, you click on that link, it gives you the Ogdoid. I'm just going to skip right to the interesting part. The oldest known pictorial representation of the group do not predate the time of Seti, New Kingdom 13th century BC. That's unusual time. But remember, that's the first pictorial representation. That means that these gods existed only in like a text form, not in this pictorial form. When the group appears to be rediscovered by the theologians of Hermopolis for the purpose of a more elaborate creation account. Now that's going to be important in a little bit. Now I'm going to go back to Amun. So when I was looking at Amun, I came across this thing on the left corner here. It says Amun depicted as Amun Min. Very interesting. Amun Min, who the fuck is Amun Min? I caught, I saw it. I was like, damn, this guy's black and he's got a huge boner here. So... Here's what Min, I'm going to skip right to the good parts of Min. By the new kingdom, he was also fused with Amun in the form of Min Amun, who was also the serpent Urta, a Kamutef, the bull of his mother, also known as father of his own mother as well as her son. There we go. That's like the exact story of Jesus. And this goes exactly back to my point that these people, this cult, is also behind the modern day religions and also behind Jesus. It's, it's a, a, an exact retelling. And it's not an accident. It's not like what is claimed, I'll say it again, it's not like what's claimed in the Zeitgeist documentary. The, the reason why this similarity exists is because of the stars. You know, they're making the same observations. No, it's not because they're making the same observations. It's because it was the same fucking cult. Right here, perfect example of it. God is supposed to be uh, the father of Jesus, but he's also supposed to be Jesus. You know, he's, he is the father of his own mother as well as her son. So anyway, let's move back onto the Thebian triad. Let's look at the other uh, gods associated to this. So we just looked at Amun. Let's look at his consort, Mut. So her name literally means mother. Mutt was considered a primal deity associated with the primordial waters of Nu, from which everything in the world was born. So there isn't too much here. Basically, Mutt, she was believed by her followers to be the mother of everything in the world. She was particularly associated as the mother of the lunar child god, Kansu. And what do we have here? Let's look at the son, Kansu. It's already basically told us that, that he's a lunar deity, but let's, let's look at him, right? So Kansu is the ancient Egyptian god of the moon. Now there are two interesting things about him, at least two very interesting things about him, and that is his name, but also the color of his skin. His Wikipedia does not tell us the meaning of the color of his skin, but Osiris's Wikipedia does, and Osiris's Wikipedia informs us that his green skin symbolizes rebirth. So this is another connection that Kansu has with Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ also has the whole resurrection thing in his story. And Kansu's green skin symbolizes resurrection or rebirth. Now, the very interesting thing here is we're going to quickly look at his name means traveler, and this may relate to the nightly travel of the moon across the sky. Notice that here it says this may relate to the nightly travel of the moon across the night sky. See, this is stupid. I don't know who thought about this. Oh, yeah, uh, He's uh, called the Traveler because the moon travels across the night sky. It's like fucking jackasses. The sun travels across the sky too. Oh yeah, I, I, I gotta pause real quick. Check out the headdress on Kansu. There goes that crescent moon with the full moon sitting inside of it. Sorry. But going back to the ridiculousness of whoever came up with this theory that his, his Traveler meaning is associated with the moon traveling across the night sky. That's not what it is at all. And actually, we're gonna now 
go back to Amun real quick. Because Amun, in his Wikipedia, it says he rose to the position of patron deity of Thebes by replacing Montu. And Montu was a falcon of war. Uh, if you look into his stuff, basically, if you look at the bottom over here by name, it says Montu's name, shown in Egyptian hieroglyphs to the right, is technically transcribed as Mentui, meaning nomad. A nomad is also a traveler. And Montu, you can see here, he has the moon on his head here. And I say it's the moon, not the sun, despite its color, because of a couple of reasons. One, if we're going to go with their logic of nomad and traveler being associated with the moon, well, this guy's name means nomad too. Another thing is that his name Montu, I know it's totally different time periods, but it sounds so similar to moon. I know that's stupid. I'll admit maybe I'm grasping at straws, but I digress. The actual meaning of this traveler and this nomad, I'm going to go into in the next part where I go into the people who existed in Egypt before these Egyptian kingdoms, before the Pharaoh. And basically, I'll just give a quick brief thing. Basically, this traveler comes from the people who became Pharaohs. Before the Pharaohs, there is a group in around Egypt, around the Levant, who were the people who apparently invented nomadic pastoralism, or basically um, noma like having a nomadic farm, like you know, taking your sheep and your herd with you. They were travelers. These original travelers, this also were the, the shepherd symbolism, the, the symbol of, oh, this, this guy was a shepherd. You see a lot of uh, people in the Bible who were claimed to be shepherds and stuff. I don't remember their exact, exactly which ones. I believe, was it Cain or was it Abel? I think Abel was a shepherd and Cain, and Cain was a farmer. Whatever, I digress. The point is that th that's actually where it all comes from, is that these people who actually became pharaohs, the original members of this club, they were nomadic pastoralists. They were basically nomadic shepherds. And that's how they basically became worshipped. They would come into Egypt during the flooding of the Nile so that their pastor can, you know, drink water and get all the all the great vegetables and stuff that grew out of the flooding of the Nile. And people then basically started to associate them with the flooding of the Nile. And if you look at the pharaohs, the pharaohs began to be worshipped because they were thought to be responsible for the flooding of the Nile. Now, I'm going to quickly say something about Amun. This is actually going to, this is going to be necessary before we go into this, this next part about the Theban royal house. And that is that Amun, um, if you look down here, as the chief deity of the Egyptian empire, Amun-Ra also came to be worshipped outside Egypt, according to the testimony of ancient Greek historiographers in Libya and Nubia. As Zeus Amun, he came to be identified with Zeus in Greece. Incredible. So there we go. Not only did this cult have a direct influence, we can clearly see, on modern-day Abrahamic religions, they also had an influence on Greek religions. But it gets even better. It gets even better. What I had to do, because I was like, you know what? I want to know about this Theban royal house. Because all I just learned about was Thebes, the city in Egypt. So I googled Theban royal house to see if I can come up with something there. And here's what I found. I found House of Thebes. I'm going to go to Timeless Myths. I look at Timeless Myths. I'm reading this. I'm like, House of Thebes. Thebes was a principal city in the valley of southern Boeotia, between north of this mountains and southeast of Lake Copaeus. The city was originally named Cadmia after Cadmus. So I stopped here. I was like, you know what? This is fucking all alien to me. I have no idea where these places are. What I did is I typed in Lake Copaeus, right? Because Cytherian Mountains, I was like, oh, that's like a whole mountain range. So I put Lake Copaeus. And what I found was Greece. I'm like, wait a second, this is like right near Athens too. I'm like, I'm like, there's no way this pharaoh is associated with this royal house in Greece. I'm like, no, that, that can't be. So I was like, you know what, let me, let me continue reading. So the city was originally named Cadmia after Cadmus, its founder and first king. So I'm like, okay, um, I'm going to have to look into Cadmus, aren't I? So I looked into Cadmus. I'm like, okay, who the fuck is Cadmus? There's a link here. Cadmus is outlined, I mean, Cadmus is underlined, there's a link there, I click on that link, I come to Wikipedia, and Cadmus, it, there's Greek pottery here, you know, I'm like, what the hell? So, when you read about Cadmus, it says he was a Phoenician prince, son of king, uh, whatever his name is, and queen, whatever her name is, of Tyre, 
and the brother, I'm like, okay, I, this, once again, it's all fucking foreign to me, I don't know what this is, I'm gonna look into son of king, you know, this king and this bitch, right, so I'm like, you know what, I couldn't really find much there, so I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna just look into of Tyree, where the hell is Tyree, so Tyree, Lebanon, that's where that link goes to, so so it's one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world. So I'm like, okay, well, where where is this exactly? You know, it's the oldest continuous inhabited city in the world. Damn, that's impressive. And it's right here, here on the map. Well, guess what? That falls under the historical known dominion of Egypt. So so wait a second, it's interesting. If you look at the at the story of Cadmus, he was sent by his parents of Tyria, and that's actually how he basically like colonize Greece. So yes, this story is actually telling us that the Egyptians colonized Greece and are directly responsible for the Greek pantheon. I mean, it's fucking insane. I mean, guys, I mean, maybe I'm totally grabbing at straws here. Please, by all means, write in the comments, you're crazy, you don't know what you're talking about, and then provide me facts that will correct my possibly erroneous way of thinking. Let's go back to almost the first. Just finishing him off real quick. Almost the first assumed the throne after the death of his brother. I don't know if his brother died. I, I would probably better theorize that his brother was put to be the head of some other district or some other place under a different alias. Because that's what they love to do. And upon coronation became known as Neb Petu Re, the Lord of Strength is Re. Now, it also says the name Amos is a combination of the divine name Ah, which is Ea, and the combining form Mos like Moses. We'll, we'll get into that later on. The interesting thing that I want to say here is that this is exactly what they did. This is what I've been saying throughout this documentary, is that it was a moon cult disguised as a sun cult. They're really a moon cult, not that it really matters, disguising themselves as a sun cult. But this duality, this uh, having a surface layer hiding an inner layer, is exactly what they do today in Freemasonry, this duality that exists. One being a lie and one being the truth. And this is what they've been doing since ancient Egypt. Now, a quick thing though is, I want to look at this god Ray. So now, Ray, we know, is a sun god, okay? But the interesting thing is, is that he looks exactly like the god that Amun replaced. He looks exactly like Montu. The only difference is, is that he doesn't have the two pillars on his head and the the circle on his head is made bigger. I guess at this point, they were trying to make it seem more like the sun. So I just realized I'm like 35 to 40 minutes into this video already. This is before editing, so it's around that time period, and we're only now touching on the second pharaoh of the 18th dynasty, and the New Kingdom goes all the way up to the 20th dynasty. However, fortunately, I think that the information I covered so far, we can use that information that we just covered to rush through the rest of this information. Of course, I'm going to stop and elaborate on the information that I think is most important. So right now, let's go to the second pharaoh, Thutmose I. Thutmose I, basically, all that's important, all that we really need to know about him is that his name means Thoth is born. And Thoth, we went over him in a previous part of this documentary. Thoth is a nether moon god. Thoth is the Egyptian god of writing, magic, wisdom, and the moon. So after Thutmose I, there was some debate as to who would get the throne, whether it be his son or his daughter, who basically married his son. Yeah, they were weird like that, of course, we all know that. What ended up happening was um, his daughter, Hatshepsut, ended up getting the throne. Apparently it was through propaganda or some bullshit like that. Hatshepsut, nothing too important about her. We kind of covered her already. She was the one who opened up trade routes or extended trade routes into the land of Punt, basically modern-day Somalia. After Hatshepsut, there was Thutmose III. The person who was supposed to be pharaoh after Thutmose III ended up predeceasing him, so then, Amenemhet, so then Amenemhet became pharaoh after him, and you can see Amenemhet. I don't believe it says what his name means here, but you can see Amen is here, which has something to do with Amun. Not surprising, since Amun by this time had been, like, the biggest god in Egypt. And then after Amenemhat, there was Aminotep II. Aminotep II, it says his uh, meaning means Amun is satisfied. Yes, I'm sure Amun is satisfied. The cult behind the throne is most definitely satisfied. And then after him was Thutmose IV. 
fourth, there's like two interesting things about Thutmose the fourth. One of them is how he became Pharaoh. Apparently he became Pharaoh by using basically propaganda, very clever propaganda. And what he did was he apparently fell asleep at, uh, beneath the head of the Sphinx. And apparently at this time, the Sphinx was covered with sand all the way up to the neck. So he fell asleep underneath the Sphinx, then apparently had a dream that the Sphinx had uh, told him that if he cleared away the sand and restored it, he would become the next pharaoh. So that's what he did. He cleared away the sand. He restored the Sphinx. And after restoring the, the Sphinx, he placed a tablet known as the Dream Stella, or Steely, beneath the paws of the Sphinx. And then basically this is how he became pharaoh. That's how he like said, oh, look, you know, God or whatever wants me to be pharaoh. So that's how he became pharaoh. Another thing that's interesting about him is that he established peaceful relationships with uh, Matini. Matini, here you can see it on the map. We've kind of already gone over the fact that Egypt already had control over this. So I'm sure that what actually happened was each of these places, each of these supposed separate empires, I'm sure that they were actually being ruled by somebody who was connected to the, to the cult that was behind the pharaoh. So, you know, they just acted, you know, just like they do today where they're like, oh, yeah, you know, this country has conflict with this country, but really they're both working for the same party. That's probably what was happening here. It's all part of the Hegelian dialectic, the problem reaction solution. You have this problem that there is a kingdom over there that that is after us. You know, we're in conflict with them. So then the people have a reaction where the, they're like, oh, my God, we don't want to die. So the solution, of course, is, you know, big government, more power to the pharaoh or more power to the state. And not only that, but this conflict, which I will be looking at in a future documentary, not the conflict of this time period, but I'm going to be looking at the conflicts from about the Revolutionary War to modern day wars like, you know, fucking the Iraq and Afghanistan war. I'm going to be looking at all these wars and I'm going to be showing how they use these wars as a form of population control, but not population control in the normal sense where people think, oh, they just want to cut down the population that they see as a threat to them or that they see as unwanted. So then we have Aminotep III, and according to Wikipedia, his reign was a period of unprecedented prosperity and artistic splendor when Egypt reached the peak of its artistic and international power. This isn't too surprising since his father established peaceful relations with Matini, but now after Aminotep III, we have Akhenaten. Here it says when he died, this is uh, Aminotep III, it says when he died in the 38th or 39th year of his reign, his son initially ruled as Amenhotep IV, but then changed his own royal name to Akhenaten. So I'm sure many of you know who Akhenaten is. Akhenaten is the pharaoh that tried to bring about a departure from traditional religion, yet in the end he would not be accepted. So there are some things that people aren't aware, and that is that Akhenaten, his actions would actually lead to the end of the 18th dynasty. Uh, what he did ended up bringing about so much chaos that they that the uh, clear rights of secession from the 18th dynasty were like totally lost. You know, people didn't know who was actually supposed to be the one seceding the throne. So, um, but afterwards, when they did start a new dynasty, the new dynasty actually discredited Akhenaten and his immediate successors. Uh, they refer to Akhenaten himself as the enemy or that criminal in archival records. Now, the reason why he was so disliked isn't simply because he was trying to make a departure from the traditional religion. It's because he actually attacked the cult, the cult of Amun. So during the latter part of the 18th dynasty, the pharaoh Akhenaten, also known as Aminotep IV, disliked the power of the temple of Amun and advanced the worship of the Aten, a deity whose power was manifested in the sun disk both literally and symbolically. He defaced the symbols of many of the old deities and based his practices upon the deity, the Aten. He moved his capital away from Thebes, but this abrupt change was very unpopular with the priest of Amun, who now found themselves without any of their former power. And after Akhenaten was the short-lived pharaoh, whose name I'm not even going to try to pronounce because I definitely cannot, but his, I'll just call him Smen. But Smen, it's interesting, you can tell his name is actually a departure from those cult-like names that we were looking at before, such as like Amun and Thutmos, which all refer to moon deities. After him is Nefertiti, uh, another one. Her name does not seem to be related to any of these cults. 
And then after her was Tutankhamun, that's her son, also known as King Tut. Now, an interesting thing is that his original name, Tutankhamun, means living image of Aten, but then he changed his name to Tutankhamun, meaning living image of Amun. And here we have the restoration of the cult of Amun. That's basically what Tutankhamun did. He restored cult of Amun. So here we have his reign. Given his age, the king probably had very powerful advisors, presumably including General Hormheb and Grand Visor A, who succeeded Tutankhamun. Hormhead records that the king appointed him lord of the land as hereditary prince to maintain law. He also noted his ability to calm the young king when his temper flared. In his third regional year, under the influence of his advisors, Tutankhamun reversed several changes made during his father's reign. He ended the worship of the god Aten and restored the god Amun to supremacy. The ban on the cult of Amun was lifted and traditional privileges were restored to its priesthood. So that's interesting. That I, I didn't know that. Um, I kind of I must have just rushed through reading about uh, Akhenaten because I didn't know that there was actually a ban put on the cult of Amun. But he ended up lifting that ban. Uh, the capital was moved back to Thebes and the city of Akhenaten abandoned. This is when he changed his name to Tutankhamun, living image of Amun, reinforcing the restoration of Amun. Okay, now for some interesting stuff. So there are some interesting things surrounding his health, appearance, and death. Ah, uh, crap. Just as I was about to get into something important, I have to stop to make a quick note. So when I had done the research for this, I did it years ago. I had collected a whole bunch of screenshots years ago. I did all this while I was doing the research. I was collecting screenshots. So most of the screenshots that you're seeing are years old at this point. They're a couple years old, at least two years old. So I had to go to Wikipedia now to Tutankhamun because I wanted to highlight a couple more things. And I find that his Wikipedia has changed since when I did the research. And the most important thing, the thing that is important to us is his health and death, which is what we're going to be looking at here. It was his health, death, and appearance. Now, before, his health and appearance were separate. They were under their own category, and death and his death was also under its own category. And there was also some information under his death that is no longer in the Wikipedia. I don't know why they took it out. But anyway, let me just cover it, and then I'll, I'll get to that part with his death when we get to that part. Okay, so... His health, his appearance wasn't very good. You know, he had large front incisors. He looked very strange. He had a, a thin, like, waist, but rounded hips. I'm sure many of you have seen images of his father. He looked like his father. He had other issues, cleft hard palate, and uh, possibly a mild case of scoliosis. The, the CAT scans that were done in 2005 also revealed that his right foot was flat and his and his left foot was clubbed and suffered bone necrosis. So that's his appearance. So now genetic testing, going with his health. So genetic testing revealed that he had malaria. Him and the other people that were around him had malaria. And this is important because it's currently the oldest known genetic proof of the ailment of malaria. And the team that tested his DNA discovered DNA from several strains of the parasite, which indicates that he was repeatedly infected with the most severe strain of malaria. Now, this is important because I believe it relates to his death. So let's look at his death real quick. So there are no surviving records of the circumstances of Tutankhamun's death, and it has been the subject of considerable debate and major studies. And basically, long story short, ultimately it has been determined that his death was likely the result of the combination of his multiple weakening disorders, a leg fracture, perhaps as the result of a fall, and a severe malaria infection. But I call bullshit to that for the following reasons. So we're going to start with what used to be under his death. So what used to be there was what this Harvard microbiologist Ralph Mitchell had theorized. And he theorized that Tutankhamun was buried in a hurry. Mitchell reported that dark brown splotches on the decorated walls of Tutankhamun's burial chamber suggested that he had been entombed even before the paint had a chance to dry. Next, we're going to go to the current Wikipedia, which has this little section about an intact tomb. And it says, 
Tutankhamun was buried in a tomb that was unusually small considering his status. His death may have occurred unexpectedly before the completion of a grander royal tomb, causing his mummy to be buried in a tomb intended for someone else. This would preserve the observance of the customary 70 days between death and burial. So I'm going to pause there. We're going to ask ourselves, because good thing we can think for ourselves and we can call bullshit to people who are selling bullshit. And that is, so you say his death may have occurred unexpectedly. That's, that's their way to try to rationalize why he's buried in somebody else's tomb, in a tomb that's obviously not meant for him. However, they claim that his death was the product of long-term degenerative disorders coupled with a fall. They said a combination of his multiple weakening disorders, a leg fracture, perhaps as the result of a fall, and a severe malaria infection. Now remember, it's not a severe malaria infection, because before they said, the, the people who did the DNA, since they found so many different types of malaria parasites in his body, or, or the DNA of multiple malaria parasites, so, I mean, he had to have been showing, like, signs of sickness for a while, signs of poor health for a while. I don't buy this, oh, his death was unexpected, and thus they had to bury him in a separate tomb. And there's actually more evidence to this. And this has also been removed from the current Wikipedia. I don't know why. It used to be in the Wikipedia. I don't know why they got rid of this entire section. I could understand if they were going to amend the section or if they were going to add to the section in some way. But no, they got rid of the entire section of the aftermath of his death. So the aftermath of his death, with the death of Tutankhamun and the two stillborn children buried with him, the Thutmoseoid family line came to an end. So the Amama letters indicate that Tutankhamun's wife, recently widowed, wrote to the Hittiti king, whatever his name is, asking if she could marry one of his sons. The letters do not say how Tutankhamun died. In the message, this lady, I guess that's his, uh, his wife, says that she was very afraid, but would not take one of her own people as husband. However, check this out, the son of that king that was sent to go marry her was killed before reaching his new wife. And shortly after that, A, some douchebag, I guess he was like one of the, I guess he was one of Tutankhamun's advisors, married Tutankhamun's widow and became pharaoh as a war was fought between the two countries and Egypt was left defeated. So the two countries, I guess that is the, I guess that's Egypt and the country, the guy who sent his son over who was killed. The fate of Tutankhamun's widow, I can't pronounce her name, is not known, but she disappears from record, and A's second wife, Tay, becomes great royal wife. After A's death, Hormheb usurped the throne and instigated a campaign of damnatio memore, which I guess means damning their memory, against him. Tutankhamun's father, Akhenaten, stepmother Nefertiti, his wife, uh, Tutankhamun's wife, half-sisters, and other family members were also included. Not even Tutankhamun was spared. His images and kotches were also erased. Hormheb himself was left childless and willed the throne to Parnassu, who founded the Ramzidi family line of pharaohs, which is basically the beginning of the 19th dynasty. And here we have A's Wikipedia, and yes, we do find he was a close advisor to two and perhaps three of the pharaohs who ruled before him, and was said to be the power behind the throne during Tutankhamun's reign. Although I'm sure he wasn't the power behind the throne, and we kind of know this because it was already said that Hormheb was actually basically given power during Tutankhamun's reign. He basically gave uh, Hormheb, like, the ruling power. And we also know this because A had a very short rule, and he was basically quickly replaced with Hormhead. I think if anything, A was just a person to fill in for the transition. He was probably liked more than Hormhead. So then Hormhead quickly took over. And then Hormhead, basically we can say that Hormhead does sort of found the 19th dynasty. Because he's the one who gives the power of the pharaoh to the guy who starts the 19th dynasty. Or the Ramsian line of pharaohs. So let's get right to Ramses the first. So right away... It lets us know that Ramses, uh, although he was the founder of the 19th dynasty, in reality, his brief reign only marked the transition between the reign of Hormheb, who had stabilized Egypt in the 18th dynasty, and the rule of the powerful pharaohs of this dynasty, in particular his son Seti I and grandson Ramses II, 
who would bring Egypt up to new heights of imperial power. So there's two things worthy of noting about Ramses I, other than his short reign. It's that he had an incredibly short reign, and his burial was hurried. So under his death, we find Ramses I enjoyed a very brief reign, as is evidenced by such and such. The king had little time to build any major buildings in his reign, and was hurriedly buried in a small and hastily finished tomb. Sounds like what happened to Tutankhamun. The Egyptian priest Menetho assigns him a reign of 16 months, but this pharaoh certainly ruled Egypt for a minimum of 17 months, a whole extra month. And then they say basically based off of the Stella, which ordered the provision of new endowments of food and priest for the Temple of Pita. And if you read on, that's pretty much the only thing he was known for, was ordering provisions for this temple. So now the second thing is, of course, this temple of Pita. Who the hell is Pita? So Pita, if you look him up, the only thing that we really need to know, the most important thing about him, is his origin and symbolism. Pita is an Egyptian deity and considered the Demiurge, who existed before all other things, and by his will, thought the world into existence. It was first conceived by thought and then realized by word. Huh. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Huh. I don't know, man. <laughs> that sounds awfully familiar. Oh, no, it's got to be some kind of coincidence, right? I mean, there's, there can't be any other sort of relationship, right? Oh, wait, what's this? Pita is the patron of craftsmanship, metalworking, carpenters, shipbuilders, and sculptors. Huh, I, I could swear I know of another story that has a demiurge like this and who also has somebody related to that demiurge who's into carpenting or who was a carpenter, right? Oh, no, no. Oh, oh wait, what's this? There's more? Okay, so in popular culture, in the 1956 motion picture, The Ten Commandments, directed by this douchebag, depicts Ramses I as the pharaoh who orders the elimination of the firstborn of every Hebrew slave family in Egypt, leading to the scenario of the future prophet Moses. So that's, that's interesting. That's a lot, of, a lot of connections there. I wonder if Hollywood was trying to tell us something. I wonder if Hollywood was trying to tell us that actually this guy is partly responsible for the beginning or something that happened at the beginning of Christianity. And that's actually what I think happened. I think that at this point, the club, they decided to start working on a new religion that they were going to control the masses with. And this religion basically turned into the three Abrahamic religions of today. But wait, there is more. So Pita is actually also part of a triad. Yes, this lovely trinity that they seem to just love to use. So as you can see on Pita's Wikipedia page in the Triad of Memphis, he is the husband of Sekhmet and the father of Nefertum. He is also regarded as the father of the sage Imhotep, which isn't too important. So let's look at these other two deities, the one that he is the husband of and the one that he's a father of. But wait real quick, before I do that, I need to let you guys know that his green skin does symbolize something. And to find out what his green skin symbolizes, we have to look at Osiris, because unfortunately they don't give us all the information in every Wikipedia thing. So we actually have to take information from other places in order to get the complete picture. So let's see what Osiris's green skin symbolizes. It says here, this is taken from the Osiris Wikipedia page, his green skin symbolizes rebirth. So I say Pita is a rebirth of a previous god, but that's not important. That's just a little digression. I just thought that you guys should know that. So Sekhmet, his wife, there isn't anything too important about her. I say the most important things about her is that she's associated with the sun. And this is important that all three of these triads are no longer associated with the moon. I do not believe that this is the cult disappearing. I think that this is the cult taking on a new image. Now, the sun also, Nefertim. Now, he's the one that we really need to look at because this is basically Jesus Christ. This is uh, one of the early incarnations of Jesus Christ. There are ones that are earlier, but you know this is him being refined until he eventually becomes the Jesus Christ that we know today. Nefertim, here on his Wikipedia page, the information is kind of like scattered. Basically, the important stuff that we need to take it from this Wikipedia page, especially is this water lily on his head. So now they have gotten rid of the moon and stuff on the head. 
and now they have replaced it with a water lily. And this is a refining of the halo. Okay, this is basically a halo on his head. To get more compact information, to get the information that's a, a little bit more put together and focusing on his mythology, I decided to just Google Nefertim myth, and I decided to choose this Google page. It was just one I picked. You know, I didn't really do much searching. I was just like, fuck it, I'll pick this one. So Egyptian gods and goddesses. And here's what it says. It says some pretty interesting things. Of course, Nefertim was an ancient sun god of Lower Egypt who was originally considered to be an aspect of Atom. Now, Atom is the, the sun. Remember, that's basically what Akhenaten was worshipping, which I find very strange that this is so close to when Akhenaten was thrown out for trying to worship the Atom. But whatever. The important thing is that this is exactly like Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is considered to be an aspect of God. He is the son of God, but he is also God. Another interesting thing is, is that he was, uh, it says that, it says that he represents the sunrise, or basically the sun, and created mankind from his tears. Now, the interesting thing about this is that, okay, he created mankind from his tears, and technically Jesus saved mankind with his suffering. So here, this guy created mankind with his tears, and Jesus saved mankind with his tears, or basically his suffering. So let's move on. Nefertin has been given titles such as He Who Is Beautiful, The Young Atom, and Water Lily of the Sun. He was also associated with rebirth. Huh. Is Jesus Christ also associated with rebirth? I believe so. He's associated with resurrection. He rises three days later, and then they claim that he's going to have the second coming, or whatever the fuck that crap is. Further going on, at the bottom here, he is also depicted as a man with the head of a lion. I think that this is related to Jesus Christ's long hair. So the head of a lion, if you look at pictures of Christ, his hair is kind of like a lion mane. I know, maybe, maybe I'm grabbing at straws. That's just how I see it. You guys can disagree with me on that. Or as a beautiful baby, sitting in or on a lotus bud. Ah, is Jesus Christ represented as a beautiful baby quite often? Yes, he is. Now let's move on to the next pharaoh now. So Seti the first. The name Seti means of Set. Now I was bothered by this because it's pretty common knowledge that Set is a lunar deity, that he is associated with nighttime. Unfortunately, when I looked into Set, I couldn't find anything saying that directly. However, I did find this picture of Set. It's a it's a statue of Set. And it's set with this other deity, Neftis. And you can see the deity next to him has that moon symbol that we've looked at twice already on her head. The crescent moon with the full moon sitting inside of it. And those horns on set here are associated, basically eventually become the devil horns. But it's actually also associated with the moon. That is another crescent moon symbol. I talk about that, I believe, in part four? Maybe in part three. Let's go back to set, right? There's some interesting things here. So, of course, uh, the name Seti means of Set, which indicates he was consecrated to the god Set. Now, here it says, as with most pharaohs, Seti had several names. Upon his ascension, he took the name, which basically means established in the justice of Re. His better known nomen, or birth name, is translated as, I can't pronounce that, meaning man of Set, beloved of Pita. So here we have again the duality, the contradictive duality, where his pharaoh name has something to do with the sun god, but his real name has something to do with moon gods. But the most interesting thing about Seti I is not his name, but his burial. So his well-preserved tomb was found in 1817 in the Valley of the Kings. It proved to be the longest at 446 feet, 136 meters, and deepest of all the New Kingdom royal tombs. It was also the first tomb to feature decorations, including the legend of the destruction of mankind. Now, the legend of the destruction of mankind, when you click on that link, it brings you to Book of the Heavenly Cow. Now, this is going to tie right back in to Christianity or the Abrahamic religions. So, the Book of the Heavenly Cow, or the Book of the Cow of Heaven, is an ancient Egyptian text thought to have originated during the Amana period, and in part describes the reasons for the imp describes the reasons for the imperfect state of the world in terms of humankind's rebellion against the supreme sun god Ra. 
divine punishment was inflicted through the goddess Hathar, with the survivor suffering through separation from Ra, who now resides in the sky on the back of Nut, the heavenly cow. Basically, long story short, the story of Adam and Eve comes almost directly from this story, or from this legend. The next pharaoh is Ramses II, and an interesting thing about Ramses II is that he is another pharaoh who is associated with the Exodus. Now, for the sake of time, and because there really isn't much else interesting about the rest of the pharaohs in the 19th dynasty, I'm going to now skip to the first pharaoh of the 20th dynasty. I think I'm skipping one, two, three, four, five... I'm skipping about five or six pharaohs. Not a big deal. Nothing really happens interesting there. You guys can look up those pharaohs for yourself. Let me know in the comments section if I miss anything interesting about them, but I don't think I did. This next pharaoh that I'm going to be talking about, though, is very interesting. So, set Heti, or however the fuck you pronounce his name, it seems like his name doesn't really have any meaning associated with it in terms of being related to any deities. Um, he has an interesting ascension to the throne. He was not the son, brother, or direct descendant of either this asshole or this asshole, the immediate preceding two pharaohs, nor that of Siptah's predecessor, Seti II, um, who uh, this guy basically considered the last legitimate ruler. It is possible that he was a usurper who seized the throne during a time of crisis and political unrest, or he could have been a member of a minor line of the Ramsid royal family who emerged as a pharaoh. So he could be related to the earlier pharaohs from the 19th dynasty, the ones that I actually talked about. However, the interesting thing here about him is not really where he came from, but his genetics. So in December 2012, a genetic study conducted by the same researchers who decoded King Tutankhamun's DNA found that Ramses III, this pharaoh's son and second pharaoh of the 20th dynasty of Egypt, belonged to this DNA group, Y-DNA, Halpa group, EV38. I might as well be speaking fucking alien to you. So I click on this link, and what do I find? I find that this group, that this DNA group, is almost exclusively found in Ethiopia, which I believe adds more credit to the account of Herodotus that we looked at earlier. And Ramses III, which is basically the son of the first pharaoh of the 20th dynasty that we just looked at, and Ramses III is the one whose DNA was tested to have found that he was actually Ethiopian. Uh, there's not much interesting about him. He had a long reign, but his reign saw the decline of Egyptian political and economic power linked to a series of invasions and internal economic problems. I'm sure that there is more to that than what is being said. He was assassinated in the harem conspiracy led by one of his second wives. And then there's more people. Pretty much nothing else is interesting except for, I believe it's Ramses V. Yeah, Ramses V. His reign was characterized by the continued growth of the power of the priesthood of Amun. So Amun makes a comeback or the power of it gets increased. Another interesting thing about Ramses V is that the mummy of Ramses V was recovered in 1898 and seems to indicate that he suffered from smallpox due to lesions found on his face, and this is thought to have caused his death. He is thought to be one of the earliest known victims of the disease. This I find kind of interesting. You have King Tutankhamun, who is the earliest case of malaria, and now you have Ramses V to be the earliest case of smallpox. Did they manufacture these diseases? Uh, I don't know. The conspiracist in me wants to say yes, but the reason thinker in me wants to say I don't know. Uh, there's no way I can prove it. I can speculate. And I would speculate that yes, they did. But I don't know enough about these diseases to understand whether or not they could have been manufactured or not. So after Ramses V, there's Ramses VI. Nothing interesting about Ramses VI during his... Time as Pharaoh, Egypt's political and economic decline continue unabated, and he is the last king of Egypt's new kingdom, whose name is attested to in the Sine. So, I'm going to just kind of skip everything else. I think I, I made my point. The rest of the Pharaohs, there isn't anything too interesting about them, except for later on, after Egypt gets split up, after the new kingdom, 
pretty much you have the uh, North Egypt and South Egypt. They're ruled by two different people. But uh, something very interesting comes up with this guy, Susanus II, or I, I'm pretty confident that P is silent. But Susanus II, this guy actually, I mentioned him earlier. He is often considered the same person as the high priest of Amun, known as Susanus III. So, yes, the high priest of Amun, he was pretty much the ruler, like the high priest of Amun was the ruler of Upper Egypt. Whoever was the high priest of Amun ruled Upper Egypt, and then a separate person ruled Lower Egypt. This guy managed to rule Upper and Lower Egypt just under two different aliases. And they weren't even that different, you know, Susanus the second, Susanus the third. It's like, come on, man, who are you guys fucking kidding? Anyway, I'm going to end this part here. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys learned something. I know it was pretty fucking long. The next part will be much shorter. The next part is going to be covering the uh, pre-kingdoms of Egypt. It's going to be covering Egypt before any of the kingdoms. And I'm going to show precisely where the pharaohs came from. Although I briefly mentioned that in this part already. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Hopefully it won't take like a year and a half or two years to come out. I'll try to have it out within the next like month or two. I'm going to be doing other videos in between. So anyway, you guys and girls take it easy. As I said already, I'll see you in the next one.